thank you, everybody. We won't go into all the uh, niceties, because I understand that my predecessor said uh, nice things to all of you. So uh, I will excuse myself, but I really am happy to be here, not for the first time. And I have a great admiration and respect for this institution. Uh, thank you, uh, Dennis, for leading the, uh, the board. For you guys for being involved and supportive. I also have a family relative who's active here, who is the smarter part of the family, and my brother Mike. So uh, I hope you have very successful deliberation. And thank you, Avinoam, for pursuing the cause uh, of st thinking strategically about the future of the Jewish world. Because uh, what we do lack as part of our, gov at least governmental uh, behavior, is lack of strategic thinking ahead. Yesterday's controller report about the events in Gaza in 2000, uh, at the end of 2014 in Protective Edge speak for themselves in the sense that it says specifically that there was no strategic planning ahead and during the operation itself. And I think this is part of a phenomena which we see in many events. And one of the issues that there is no strategic thinking at all in the uh, uh, corridor, corridors of power in Israel is what will happen to the Jewish world generations from now. In fact, part of our debate, political debate, about the future of the territories, about the two-state solution, stems from the uh, real debate about protecting the nation state of the Jewish people. This is the cause. This is the cause uh, of Israel. This is the raison d'etre of the state of Israel. And this is part of the uh, debate that looms over everything, and I'll relate to it later. But when you think about it, if you want to protect the nation state of the Jewish people, on the one hand, and you don't think about the future of the Jewish people, on the other, then we are actually betraying uh, our uh, duty uh, to the Jewish people. And that's why I appreciate the fact that you guys are discussing it to here today. In fact, these years, which were supposed to be years of blossoming, years of inclusion of Jews all over the world, years of less anti-Semitism, and years of looking ahead about, uh, let's say, more uh, education, traditionalism, literature, uh, what do we do about uh, Jewish continuity, uh, assimilation, so forth. All of a sudden, the phenomena of anti-Semitism rises again and rises uh, in, uh, democ in democracies, in Western nations. And I have to say a word about the way it is perceived from here about what is going on in the JCCs and in the United States. For, for me, as a graduate of a high school in New York, a famous Jewish high school, Ramaz. For me, uh, where I've seen so much since then, I've never imagined that I would see so many acts of anti-Semitism against Jews in the United States. Now, everybody is walking on a very thin ice here in order not to embarrass anybody. So I'm here not to embarrass anybody. I am sure the administration will deal with it forcefully. I'm sure the president will relate to it. I'm sure the White House will relate to it. I'm sure the authorities will deal with it. I'm sure. But that doesn't derogate from the fact that we need to discuss it. The fact that 50 JCCs are attacked at once in a very short time is a red alert. And we need to talk about it and see what needs to be done. The fact that two cemeteries were desecrated, unimaginable, unimaginable picture in American Jewish history, as far as I can recall, speaks for itself and requires dealing with it, understanding where it comes from, understanding the roots of the anti-Semitic activities in the United States, understanding how ugly is the KKK and its activities, and what does David Duke tweet. And we are here to discuss it too, from Israel, and not to be ashamed about it. And lastly, I was cynically attacked by some journalists when I've said this week that at least on the Israeli side, we simply should assume that some of these phenomena will encourage more Jews to come here. And we should be ready for that. 
Because what are we dealing with? Our people here have been doing, dealing with Zionist events and with the Jewish agency, with immigration for years. You are calling for immigration. There will be more immigration from the United States as much as we've seen also from France. We simply need to understand that, not to have any guilt complexes, not blame anybody, respect the United States and its great values and its great constitution and its great spirit of freedom, but identify and speak about the issues themselves. And therefore, I think that part of when you deal with planning or identifying the immediate objectives of this era, also the ability to give uh, alternatives to uh, Jewish families who may feel that they would like now, after they've never thought about it before, to come to Israel. And we should be ready for that as well and welcome them wholeheartedly and encourage it. So that is one major issue that needs to be discussed in this, in this floor. And the second major issue that needs to be discussed in this floor, and I know that my friend Lapid spoke about it before, is of course the issue of the Jewish streams, the streams in Judaism and their place in Israel. Unfortunately, it falls again, 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 and again within the ample, ample, uh, ample borders of um, uh, political battles within the Israeli political scene and outside, rather than holding and moving forward with discussions that can lower the tension and bring the solutions. And let me explain to you my position about it. I am the um, founding uh, person, founding father of the solution of the Kotel. In 1999, as Barack entered his cabinet in the summer of 99, the first thing, and I was government secretary, that came to our floor was a demonstration of conservative congregations demanding to pray in Tisha B'Av in the Kotel, within the Kotel itself. And that, was, that followed demonstrations of women of the Kotel. I will concise it and just say to you that I, I took it upon myself and I came to an historical solution which, of course, part of the secret of it was to keep it quiet for a while, whereby Robinson's Arch was declared as the prayer site, the alternative kotel for the conservative movement, and it was agreed that it will serve further also the reform movement. The prayer site is incredible. For those of you who haven't been there, you see uh, the um, stones of the uh, walls being burnt during Titus's attack. It's a very spiritual, beautiful, and since then, Jews come from all over the world, have bar mitzvahs and events, and the condition of the conservative leadership who negotiated with me was that the government of Israel and the rabbinate will somehow, indirectly, respect it. And for this matter, I got the Sefer Torah and the prayer books and the shawls from the rabbinate itself to me as government secretary and I delivered it to the conservatives and we declared it and it started operating and then the women of the Kotel went to the Supreme Court to appeal against it. And I came and nine judges came, nine judges came to the Robinson's Arch site and the President Barak and his deputies wanted to see that people can touch the stones kiss the stones and pray, they've seen it, and they gave a judgment, ruling four against five against four, saying this is the solution rather than accepting an ongoing battle within the premises of the current Kotel. And, that, and they adopted my uh, venue, and since then every government secretary has been dealt with it, upgraded it, developed it more and more. The last one being Avichai Mandelblit, Currently, the Attorney General, who, who opened it up in discussions with Nathan Sharansky uh, to build a whole site for the Kotel prayers. And unfortunately, as the solution was approved by the government under the promise of the Prime Minister, in quiet understandings with the relevant elements in the ultra-Orthodox world, the way it was launched led to such a political clash rather than working smartly that now we are in a limbo and it is stuck. And I believe the way to resolve it is not by direct clash and conflict. 
I hear what Arya Derry says. I spoke to him at length about it. I hear what the reform movement says. I spoke to them at length about it. I think everybody needs to calm down and I think needed a solution needs to be worked out by the leadership of Israel. It's a strategic issue. The Prime Minister has been procrastinating about it for the last two years since his promise and the abolishment of the, of the uh, implementation of the plan. He yesterday announced that he has appointed Minister Hanegbi to deal with it. He is an efficient minister. I hope he'll be able to come forward with solutions, but I call upon everybody to find the work to talk, to, to, the way to speak to each other quietly in closed rooms in order to resolve it, because the last thing the Jewish people needs, the last thing the Jewish people needs is another battle amongst itself and uh, another uh, quarrel and clash amongst Jews who have enough uh, challenges in of themselves as we are discussing them today. And finally, and then I'll open the floor for questions I, as I was asked, is the issue of the political process with our neighbors. Why am I saying that? Because there are friends here who've asked me about it. Yes, uh, last week there was a an exposure by Barack Ravid of Arvitz newspaper about a summit which was held in Aqaba exactly a year ago under the auspices of King Abdullah of Jordan at the summit, this confidential summit, attended Prime Minister Netanyahu, Secretary of State John Kerry, and the President of Egypt, uh, Sisi. And that was the basis for, of which I thereafter accepted um, to start negotiating with Netanyahu about a national unity government in order to pursue the solution, a, a peace process solution, the two-state solution, and try to change history. And we could have done it. Unfortunately, Netanyahu fled away in the last moment, as always because of his political allies within his own party and within his own coalition, especially Bennett who's been holding him uh, in the neck for quite some time about any ability to proceed with the process. And I'm coming again and saying the following. This, uh, the idea which was mentioned at the White House, one state, two states, even speaking about the possibility of one state is the most dangerous threat to the, to, the to the future of the nation state of the Jewish people. We have to understand it. We cannot avoid it. We have to think what will happen here 10, 20, 30, 40 years from now. Are we really moving to a Bosnian situation? Are we really losing the majority of Jews between the sea and the Jordan River? And are we not understanding this risk? And with all the security problems, believe me, there are many, one can deal with them. We need to show boldness and courage to move forward yet again, to separate from the Palestinians. I came to three major conclusions. One is that this settlement enterprise, as it is today, all over the West Bank, is risking the future of the nation state of the Jewish people. Two, that this settlement uh, enterprise, as it is today, risks the main, the, main, the main element of a Jewish democratic state. And finally, the last conclusion is that it cannot be resolved overnight in one big theater or show or effort, but rather in a gradual process. And I've offered 10 points uh, of how to move towards this process, including more authority to the Palestinians on the one hand, and the, a more nation building on their, on their part, including security issues on the other, on a more drawn out process. But what I'm saying is, I'm not gonna bore you out with all the details, except that if you're dealing with the future of the Jewish people, one needs to understand that the pulsating heart of the Jewish world as it is around the world today is Israel. And if Israel is threatened not only on the security basis, but first and foremost on its mere nature as the nation state of the Jewish people, as was declared from 1947 onwards, it's almost suicidal. And we will be marking in May 50 years to the Six Day War, and, uh, and we need to take bold decisions and as a nation. And I know you're seeing the Prime Minister today. I hope you'll be able to ask him, what exactly are you doing to prevent us from 
uh, skidding slowly but surely towards a disaster of a one-state solution. Thank you all very much, and I'll be happy to answer any questions which you deem fit. <laughs> Please, Dennis. But I guess you need uh, How do you want to do it? Okay, if not, I'll repeat the question. Ah, you have a microphone, good. Well, you, you made a powerful case for why Israel, in a sense, is drifting towards a one state or a binational outcome. Many people here, certainly, and outside of Israel, understand that that's a danger and see it. Does the body politic in Israel see that as a danger? That's a very good question because there's always a difference between what people say in closed rooms and what they say outside. It's part of the issue of politics at large. Even on the issue of the other issue which I mentioned, which was the Jewish streams, I'm telling you people say things differently in closed room than what they say outside. And everybody's to blame. Same goes here, I think, there is a clear majority of understanding, understanding the threat. There's a debate of what the costs for that threat should be and how risky it is. And it's all very legitimate. In my mind, the uh, issues that are being brought to a public discussion are also between me and Netanyahu as to the security elements of any process or agreement are, are vital. But at the end, the problem is that when the moment of truth comes, the political system cannot rise above, above and seize the moment and move towards it. And actually now there's a, a historical opportunity. Clearly there is a historical regional opportunity. Everybody sees it, everybody understands it, everybody identifies the unique coalition which has been, uh, been created here slowly but surely by nations who identify Iran and Daesh and ISIL as their threat and look at Israel as their major partner. But in order to break the ceiling and get above board in a huge agreement with Israel, accepting it in the region for the first time after seven years or 70 years of independence, they need to see a real process with the Palestinians. And this is a vital interest of Israel. So they all speak about it. But when it comes to the moment of truth, of course, politics influences everything. And I therefore believe that uh, it has to be done in a way where the leaderships don't, you know, take the moment. I told that to Netanyahu. I told him I'm willing to pay all the price. My party hated it. My voters hated it. They didn't understand why I'm talking to him. I said to the people, it's me or him. It's us or him. But at the end, there was a moment of truth where we could have changed the regional history and the relationship between us and the Palestinians, and he flunked. And that's very tragic in my mind. And I think that it, since the world has a vested interest and since the Israelis have a vested interest, we have to find a moment whereby Israelis will understand they have no choice. Please. Just say your name. Sergio della Pergola. So I, I should have mentioned Sergio no, della no. Pergola because Professor della Pergola is the guy I've been quoting endlessly. Since he is a huge demographer, you know him well, he's saying that between the Jordan and the sea, there are more Arabs than Jews. Thank you. You have it all in his website. So, Mr. Herzog, how and with whom are you going to lead a political party process that will generate a coalition? that will offer the Israeli voters an alternative to the present one? Well, what I have been trying to do, and I've shown it myself in the last election, where I united with Tsipi Livni to form the Zionist Union, is that we need more partners in this frontier, more partners in this coalition. The natural partners are Mr. Lapid, who currently objects to any ability of joining any coalition with us, leaning right now more towards the right, but basically biting from me, my party, and my, our camp, and uh, other partners, including Moshe Kahlon and other 
uh, political forces who are not in the Knesset. There is a large group of citizens in Israel who are willing to go together, and we need to deposit our egos somewhere and find a way to go together. Only when elections are called upon, these things happen. Secondly, I always said in the elections, I had, in elections I said I have three choices of coalition partners if I form the government. So one possible choice is not really existence. That is going with the Arab parties. The current Arab bloc, which is comprised of four parties together, a creation which was done during Netanyahu's uh, pr a previous uh, coalition with Lieberman, which is a different issue to discuss. Um, th they don't accept the underlying uh, rules. Uh, I mean, I would say the uh, underlying understanding of a Zionist uh, government. I mean, they say for themselves, we are not Zionists. We cannot be with you in a coalition. So that is one partner which is not relevant. Then there are the ultra-Orthodox and uh, Likud. The ultra-Orthodox are a, definitely a possibility for a partnership. They will not go with Lapid. They say they won't go with Lapid. They can go with us. We know how to work and how to cooperate. And, and I've been very frank with them. I said to them, I can be a partner of yours. I know how to be a partner of yours. There are certain issues I will never cross. For example, the issue of uh, the attitude towards the other streams, which I don't accept their position upon. So that's one uh, element. Oh, with the could, of course. Uh, but that is only when you need to go for a historical uh, challenge. Right now, we are working as much as we can in light of the unending failures of Netanyahu on many fronts to replace him. That's all there is to it. Please. Yes. Uh, uh, Jonathan Sarna, Brandeis University. Oh, it's a I great honor for me. I never it's a great so, honor. I read well, your books you. and I'm oh. a huge fan. Oh, all right. Well, I may it's always good to say before the question. Yeah, they, uh, <laughs> uh, my, my question really is, um, you spoke on two matters regarding American Jewry, one dealing with Aliyah, one dealing uh, with the rights of everyone at the Kotel. When you talked about demography, you indeed made clear who you relied on. Who do you rely on when you talk about American Jewry and its feelings and its views and its situation? Which experts do you rely no. on? First of all, I meet constantly with Jewish groups from all over the United States. And uh, I um, have been, I was the chairman of Birthright. I was also at the creation of Birthright. And I follow suit, I meet many young people. I, you, if you look at my speaking engagements in the United States, you'll find that I meet all groups possible from Haredim to uh, reconstructionists. And what I've gotten in the last few weeks, and I know I'm, I've ra you know, I raise certain eyebrows about what I say. What I've, gotten, what I've gotten in the United States, emails, phone calls, the people are worried from JCCs especially. They've never encountered such a phenomenon, and I think it's fair to discuss it in a polite and nice manner. Yes. We'll take that as the last question, okay. I guess. Yes. Sir, it's Dan Diger from the Jerusalem Center we know for Public Affairs. Well. We know each other well, and I have great appreciation for you. Um, your predecessor, Mr. Lapid, said that the Palestinian Authority is simply incapable at this time of coming to the table with Israel. You yourself have said publicly that now is not the time to negotiate um, a, de a demilitarized or a non-militarized Palestinian state. In the event that there were some process, whom do you trust on the Palestinian side now that Mr. Abbas is 82? Uh, the Hamas commands almost 50% of the Palestinian body politic. Whom do you trust to secure 
a potential future sovereign Palestinian entity that sits above Israel uh, and, and above Ben Gurion Airport? I think that part of the observation about the process is a bit technical. I think first and foremost, we should have presented a vision of hope to the peoples and dealt with a strong mental block on both sides uh, of both nations who don't believe it's feasible. But things you never believed are feasible are feasible. There's a whole generation of people here who never believed the Soviet Union will fall, who never believed that the Eastern Bloc will collapse, who never believed that Mandela will become president of South Africa, who never believed. I'm telling you, it's feasible. Doesn't mean that tomorrow we evacuate. Doesn't mean that tomorrow we give up the, the hills. It, me, it requires a psychological effort that requires leaders to radiate. What I've said was that under the current leaderships of those two leaders, it's impossible to reach peace. But I do believe vehemently, with full conviction, that it's possible if there were other leaders and if there, there would be a different vision. That's why in order to bypass the bilateral, the bilateral is what's stuck. You need to bring the region. When the, the region brings them into a room and looks them in the eyes and tells them, look, we are the Arab states here that never cared about the process. We left Barak and Arafat alone out there in Camp David. We ran away. Dennis can tell you about it. We ran away. Now we are younger leaders. We don't have an Israel complex anymore. We believe it's vital. We tell you here, you Palestinians will get a Palestinian state and you Israel will get your security interests because we recognize it. That can change the whole atmosphere overnight. And that's why on these premises, I believed in the regional energy to change the course of history. Thank you all very, very much.